Patrick Gordon confidently parked his car at his personal place for the VIP members of the gym. The squatting, shiny BMW, looking like a predator ready to leap, perfectly complemented Patrick's image. Or rather, Patrick Andreevich, as he was addressed by most people over the last 10 years or so. Gordon was one of the country's most successful businessmen, a co-owner and a managing director of one of the largest supermarket chains. Patrick built his empire literally from scratch. His father was an engineer and his mother was a teacher. However, still in high school, Patrick decided that he would never borrow money from his friends until he gets his paycheck. Since then, he has confidently achieved all the goals he set for himself. Gordon grabbed a sports bag from the back seat of the car and was about to enter the building of the sports club when a beggar woman stood in his way. Son, do you have a couple of kopecks for me? She asked. I need to feed my granddaughter and I don't have any money at all. Patrick frowned. What the hell is the club's security doing? Letting beggars walk around their parking lot. Now, lady, please let me pass. Son, maybe you have some food for me? Anything at all? The old lady begged, trying to tuck a strand of grey hair back under her shawl. And then Patrick was thunderstruck. He looked at the earrings in the old lady's ears, and he could not believe his eyes. Underneath the black shawl, tiny blue mistletoes sparkled in exquisite golden frames. The middle of the flowers were real diamonds. Following the man's gaze, the old lady at once pulled the shawl over her ears, but it was too late. Patrick was already firmly holding her by the hand. Where did you get these earrings? The truth, now! These are my earrings! Mine! The beggar was imploring, trying to wrestle her hand free. So, either you tell me everything or I call the police, Gordon threatened. These earrings simply cannot be yours. Ten years ago, I personally ordered them from a jeweler for somebody who was very dear to me. The beggar was silent tears rolling down her wrinkled cheeks. What's it going to be, old girl? A friendly conversation or the jailhouse? Taking the old woman's silence for consent, Patrick opened the front passenger door of his BMW. Get in the car and tell me everything. Patrick's reaction was quite understandable. The searing story was the most painful one in his life because he still could not forget the girl whom he gave them as a present. He knew that Alice was his only true love. Eleven years ago, Patrick was a budding businessman with three grocery stores and a truckload of ambitions. However, he already owned an apartment, a good car, and the money for girls and a good life. The tall, sporty brunette driving a sports car was never turned down by any girl. He was not aiming for a serious relationship and usually changed his girlfriend at least once a month. Everything changed one fine, or maybe not so fine, winter day when Patrick was hospitalized with a broken arm. He simply could not take his eyes off the young nurse, who was making the cast for him. Slender, with almost transparent skin, huge green eyes, and a heavy knot of curled brown hair that pulled back her small, pretty little head. The girl looked slim and fragile, but her tender little fingers quickly did the job. Well... It's all over now. You are free for now. Oh, you're my lifesaver. I must thank you with a good dinner. First, your lifesaver is not me, but the doctor. Andrei Ivanovich. Maybe you'll invite him to a romantic meal? Patrick laughed. The girl was quick on the draw. And second, I don't have time for romantic dinners. I work here part-time, and I study too. Well, but maybe... All the best. And next time, do be careful. Few people took rejection well, but Gordon was the worst. That same night, he was waiting for the girl by the hospital gate with a huge bouquet of pink tulips. It was mid-January and the tulips were a true luxury, beating even the roses. I really liked you. Can I at least drive you home? Such beautiful flowers. Thank you very much, but I can make it home on my own. The flowers will simply perish in the scold. Seriously, get in the car. After a few seconds' hesitation, the girl agreed. This is how Patrick and Alice's romance began. She was totally different from the girls that he was used to getting involved with. Instead of going to restaurants and nightclubs, Alice preferred to walk in the city parks or go on countryside picnics. 
She dressed well but was not particularly interested in fashion clothes. And she was an avid reader. Gordon ventured to kiss Alice only a month after they first met. And she only agreed to stay the night with him three months later. After that night, Patrick was in seventh heaven. He understood what true romance was. And he felt that he was ready to move mountains for Alice. Alice was also walking on clouds. Patrick was her first true love and she simply dissolved herself in him. However, her work and her university studies were not to be cancelled. Patrick also had a lot of work on his hands, and sometimes the lovers only met once a week. Finally, Patrick convinced Alice to move to his place. The girl was hesitant about living with a man without officially getting married, but eventually she gave in. She never regretted it. Their lives turned into a fairy tale. Gordon adored her and spoiled her like a child. Gifts, surprise two-day trips to the seaside, and whatnot. Gordon insisted that Alice learn how to drive and brought her a cute little car. For every red-letter day, Patrick ordered Alice exclusive jewelry from a jeweler he knew. The last such gift was the mistletoe earrings with sapphires. Wear them and never forget me, Patrick said it jokingly then. You sound as if this is a farewell present. The girl was even a little upset but her boyfriend's kisses quickly put her mind at ease. Alice also wanted to please Gordon, and she tried to be a good hostess. First, she had to learn the hard way because she grew up in an orphanage and sometimes didn't even know the basics of housekeeping. Over time, however, she learned everything. She liked cooking, and she wanted to please her boyfriend with tasty dishes. Patrick's parents, simple and kind people, liked Alice too. It all looked as if the happy couple was about to get married, but over the two years of their lives, Patrick never proposed to Alice. Somehow, we had an irrational fear of marriage, even though he loved living with Alice. More than anything, Patrick valued his freedom. The man saw that Alice was pretty upset about such a situation, but he just could not muster enough courage. Eventually, he did order a diamond ring from his jewelry master for the engagement, but he still kept putting off the decisive moment. I will propose to her on the anniversary of our meeting, Patrick decided. A week before the anniversary, Alice went to another city to visit her only girlfriend from the orphanage, who had recently had a baby and was inviting her to come and visit. Patrick decided that this was the perfect moment to part with his bachelor life. He gathered his friends and first led them to a restaurant, then to a nightclub. Shots were sliding down easily, music was loud, girls were smiling at them and everything was hazy from hookah smoke. He got home too, in a haze, with a sexy brunette from the club. Then everything went like a bad joke. Alice came two days earlier than expected because she was summoned urgently to work at the hospital. Patrick's telephone was dead all night, and she got home from the railway station alone. At home, she saw a disgusting scene on their bed. Her almost husband slept putting his arm around a naked whore with long black hair. Patrick will never forget that morning. Alice slept very quietly, but he woke up from her gaze, bitter, disappointed, and painful. It was the gaze of a hurt child. Patrick's heart still sank when he recalled that gaze. Alice slowly turned and left the apartment without saying a word. He rushed to catch up with her. Alice, get back, please, I'll explain everything. Alice did not even turn. While Patrick was pulling his pants down, she quickly ran down the stairs, running out of the entrance door. Patrick saw Alice flag a taxi. Evidently, this was the car that brought Alice from the railway station and, for some reason, it hadn't driven away. Patrick never laid eyes on Alice again. This is hard to believe, but she simply disappeared into thin air. She quit her job that same morning. When Patrick got to the hospital... They told him that Alice had left five minutes ago. Her phone was dead. Alice took neither the car, nor the presents, nor her things. She laughed in what she was wearing that morning and with what was in the suitcase, with which she visited her friend. Patrick did not know either the address or the telephone number of her friend. Gordon felt as if the walls were closing in on him. He regretted not having married Alice more times than he cared to remember. He could not even report Alice missing because, legally, Alice was nobody to him. Patrick even hired a private detective, but everything was futile. He was ready to howl in despair, 
Then he went on a first drinking binge of his life. But his parents and his business commitments helped him get out of this mess. Since then, Gordon has found his sole distraction in his work and the gym. Over the 10 years that ensued, he built a real empire but never got married. He was afraid of loving anyone. And whatever romantic involvements he had, they never lasted more than a few weeks. So you can imagine Patrick's surprise when he saw that the beggar was wearing the very same earrings that he once presented Alice with. There could be no mistake. These are the earrings of my daughter Alice, the old woman said quietly. Patrick looked at her closely. No, the old woman didn't look like a bum at all. Neat clothes and no foul smell either. The thing that looked strange was the black shawl wrapped over her head. Don't lie to me. Yes, these earrings belong to Alice. She's an acquaintance of mine, but for all I know, she doesn't have a mother. Where is Alice? Alice is in jail. The old lady began weeping. What? But she's not to blame for anything. The woman hastily explained. If you know her, like you say, then you know that Alice is incapable of any bad things. Yes, I'm sure of that. She's an anesthesiologist for crying out loud. She was attending an operation with the head physician of her hospital, and he has taken to the bottle lately because his wife left him. So he came to the operation with a hangover, and the patient died on his table, and they blamed Alice for everything, like the fact that she provided the wrong anesthetic and the patient died from anaphylactic shock. No matter how she tried to prove her innocence in court, the surgeon's lawyers were stronger. She was sentenced to a five-year imprisonment. Patrick was shocked and overcome by mixed feelings. On the one hand, he was happy that he found Alice. On the other, he was beyond himself with anger toward those who had set her up. And who are you to Alice? Why are you calling her your daughter? Patrick asked, more composed. I am Alice's neighbor. She and little Amy moved to our city a year ago. Alice bought an apartment on mortgage and became my neighbor. Alice and little who? She has a daughter named Amy. You didn't know, did you? No, I didn't know. I didn't know anything. How old is she? Gordon brought himself to ask. She's nine. She's such a cutie. But then again, Patrick already knew the answer. The very fact that the girl's name was Amy, like his mother's, spoke volumes. Where is the girl? Let's go to her immediately. What for? I am her father. Alice never told me about Amy's father. She never did. Nevertheless, her father is in front of you. I did one big stupid thing ten years ago and lost Alice. And I didn't even know there was a child. Who is she with now? With me. The one thing that Alice was able to do was register little Amy as my ward during the court hearing. The thing she feared most was that Amy would be taken into care. But that's the one thing that we did pull off. Let's go to your place. You'll tell me more on the way. There is not much to tell, really. I am their neighbor. I live alone. My husband died years ago. We had no children and Alice was like God's gift for me. We helped each other a lot. I babysat Amy and Alice was monitoring my health. She is a very good doctor. Then we started celebrating Red Letters Days together. And we even went on a seaside vacation once. We became a family. But then this disaster happened. It was good that I was registered as Little Amy's guardian, but the problem is that we are so short on money. We are renting out Alice's apartment, it's barely enough to pay off the mortgage, and we live in mine. I also have a senior citizen pension, but it's a joke. It's barely enough to pay the utility bills, and I need to buy food and medicine too. Whatever savings I had, they ran out. Alice didn't even have any savings at all. She invested everything in buying her apartment. I sold some of Alice's jewelry, even though it broke my heart, but I didn't have much of a choice. Only three earrings, she told me never to sell them no matter what. She said that she would pass them on to Amy in memory of her father. I put them on so that they would not get stolen from my house because a month ago, a plumber came to check on the pipes and then I found that my money was gone from the treasure chest. It wasn't big money anyway, and I didn't even notice at once that it was gone and I have no way of proving that he did it anyway. It's still a week before I get my pension, and I only have spaghetti at home, so I ventured to ask you. Your car is very beautiful, so I thought that you had money, and if your heart is kind, you would not turn me down. 
From now on, you won't want for anything. What is your name? Sharon? Thank you for everything, Sharon. I still cannot believe that you are Amy's father. The important thing is that I am sure of that. But you won't take Amy away from me. I am not going to yield her to you without Alice's consent. I am not going to take her away from you, and I hope Alice will also be with us soon. When Gordon saw his daughter for the first time, he could not hold back the tears. It was a little replica of Alice standing in front of him. The same cloud of curly hair and the same huge eyes. Only not green like Alice's, but brown like his. Patrick was looking at the girl, and he gradually came to realize that this wonder was created by Alice and him. It is his blood that runs through Amy's veins. He is her father. Patrick squatted before the girl and hugged her. Granny Sharon says you are mom's friend. Yes, sunshine? Oh, I didn't buy you a present. Sorry about that. If you want, we can go right ahead and buy whatever you wish. Can I have a piece of chocolate cake? And a cheeseburger too? Of course, Amy. Inside, Gordon was writhing with pain. His daughter, who was supposed to have grown like a princess, systematically had nothing to eat. Right now, we are going to a grocery store, my love. It's mine, I own it, but just imagine that it's yours. You can take whatever you want. Really? Yippee! Gordon drove Sharon and Amy to one of his supermarkets, attached a manager to them, and said that these two ladies had unlimited credit. Sharon, you can take absolutely anything you wish. Do not think twice about taking top-grade expensive products. Take what Amy and you like. Meanwhile, I'll go meet my lawyer. We need to get Alice out of jail. Patrick arranged a meeting with the country's best attorney, and a few days later, he came to the prison to meet Alice. Forgive me, my love. These were Patrick's first words. And you too, forgive me for not telling you about our daughter. Alice raised her enormous eyes at him. She did not change at all over these ten years. She only grew even slimmer. It was only later that I found out that I was pregnant. I was afraid to tell you because I felt that you were not ready for marriage. The thing that I feared the worst was that you would tell me to have an abortion and I would not have agreed anyway. And on that day, when I saw you, say, you in bed, I felt like I was betrayed by the person who was closest to me. I really had no one but you. I suddenly realized that you loved such a life. You would run around chasing girls. I, much more than a kid, had no place in this life. Alice, I was going to propose to you. I even bought a diamond ring. I still have it at home. I made a terrible mistake that night that I have regretted ever since. Gordon, many times I wanted to find you and tell you about Amy. But I somehow shied away from that. You became so successful, rich, and unapproachable. Maybe you would not have even believed me. Alice, the words you say? I've looked for you for years. I remember you every waking hour. I never got married because I could not fall in love with anyone. And how did you live all this time? When this happened ten years ago, I really went far away. Almost a thousand kilometers away from here. I did not really care where to go, just somewhere far away. I got a job at the hospital and I always volunteered to work overtime, so I managed to save up some money before I had Amy. When Amy was one year old, I began working again and my superiors valued me. Then ironically, I was offered a very good job in the city again, so I accepted the offer. After all, it's my hometown and I still hoped I would tell you about Amy at some point. I always told her that her daddy was a very good man, but something terrible happened. Something that she is too young to know. That kept us from being together. I bought an apartment and it looked like my prospects were good, but then there was this screw up at the hospital. Alice, I will pull you out of here, but once you're out, you'll go straight to my house. I mean, we'll go with Amy and Granny Sharon. I hope you are okay with that. Yes, I am. I have grown older and I have grown wiser. We lost too much time as it is. Alice. Yes, Gordon. Can I finally tell Amy that I'm her father? I would really want that. Yes, sure thing, go ahead. After the meeting with Alice, Gordon went to see his daughter. Amy was very happy with her new toys and goodies, but she asked straight away. Uncle Gordon, did you go to visit my mom? Will she be home soon? Yes, honey, mom says hi to you. Soon we'll all be together. And one more thing I must tell you. Just don't be shocked that I'm not really Uncle Gordon.
Well, my name is indeed Gordon, but the fact is... I'm your daddy. I thought as much. Amy laughed happily and threw her arms around his neck. A month later, Patrick and Amy were meeting Alice outside the prison gate. Granny Sharon was waiting for them at home, in Patrick's uptown residence. She ousted the housemaid from the kitchen and was baking pies at full throttle. Mother! Amy! Gordon! Alice was literally melting, surrounded by her loved ones, and Patrick's soul was singing too. He finally got rid of the feeling that real life was happening somewhere else. On the BMW's back seat, there was a huge basket of mistletoe, because if it hadn't been for the earrings, who knows which way the story would have gone.